and everlasting inheritance. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. Who can know God's counsel? Or who can conceive what the Lord intends? For the deliberations of mortals are timid and unsure of our plans. For the corruptible body burdens the soul, and the earth, earthly shelter weighs down the mind that has many concerns. And scarce do we guess the things on earth, and what is within our grasp we find with difficulty. But when things are in heaven, who can search them out? Or whoever knew your counsel, except you had given wisdom, and sent your Holy Spirit from on high. And thus were the paths of those on earth made straight. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does, does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you wishing to construct a tower is not for sit down and calculate the cost to see if there's enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlooker should laugh at him and say, this one began to build but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king marching into battle would not first sit down and decide with 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops. But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, any one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of the Lord. So I'm known as kind of an intense person. I don't know if you know that. Um, but if you think I'm intense in these circumstances, you should see me in a classroom uh, as, as a student. I'm, I'm very, um, I dig a lot with my questions because something comes up and I want the answer and something else comes up and I want the answer. Um, I, I once had a nickname for that, which basically was around the word annoying. I was just an annoying person because I'd asked so many questions trying to learn things. So this happened to me one time in the seminary. The professor, who's a, a spiritual, a, a theological mentor of mine, uh, used the word that God has disinterested love. Disinterested love. When I first heard that, I was like, well, I didn't understand. I'm like, wait, what do you mean God doesn't care about us? God love, we know God loves us. God is love, there, but it's disinterested. It's almost like, I don't care about it. I couldn't even understand. So I started asking questions, and, you know, what, what do you mean that he's disinterested? You know, that doesn't make any sense, et cetera, et cetera. And then I got the answer finally, which is God loves with no interest to himself. He's disinterested in the return. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, not that God is not sharing his love with us and is happy that we enter into his love, but that, well, it's shaped like the cross, right? Total selfless love of Christ. There's no benefit to the Lord by doing that, except maybe doing the will of the Father, right? Which he does out of love and love for us. But this is brutal torture. And obviously, he suffered the agony in the garden, went through all the, you know, all the stations of the cross, if you will, not much benefit to the Lord to do what he did. That he did it out of love, out of self-sacrificial love. We know what self-interested love looks like. And I don't mean, when I say this word, I don't mean this in a negative way either, right? Um, romance is a form of self-interested love. It's, a, it, it's important. How are people going to fall in love and get married if there isn't some pleasure involved in that? If there isn't some, like, captivating, like, oh, I'm in love, right? That's self-interested love. There's a return. There's, like, when two people are newly in love, there's a return on the love. And so it, it feels nice. One of my you know, friends was telling me, a very dear friend of mine, who's actually the mother of my goddaughter, told me a long time ago, she said, you know, when you're first married, and I pray most of you had this circumstance. When you're first married, even when you're doing things for the other person, right, there's uh, a certain pleasure to it, even if it's kind of sacrificial, because you know you're pleasing that person and you're still in the stage of kind of mutual affirmation and getting along. She said, but once young children show up, once little kids show up, you can bust your butt all day long and they have no concept of saying thank you or, or uh, affirming you, they don't know. They're just, it's just complete, and you all know this word, parents. It's complete self-sacrificial love uh, for the child. But even as a parent, though, as they say, you know, uh, there's no love like a parent's love. So even that has, um, I don't know, I don't want to call it self-interest, but there is a return, right? It's, it's fulfilling, it's, and it's love. Uh, the Lord's love is completely self-sacrificial. 
even though he is, uh, certainly he is in love. And so that's why like, I get annoying in class, because I'm trying to understand all these distinctions. But the Lord says, even dealing with children, even like we hear today, the shocking words, you cannot love them as I love them until you love as I love. Right? Until you love selflessly, you actually can't love the other people the way I love them. And what he asks of us is to do that, is to, to elevate our love to his love. And yet we have these shocking words of loving, well, hating our family, hating all the things in the world, and loving him first. You know, we are afraid of the loss. When we hear that, that, that now get into that, like what does he mean when he says hate family and possessions? Right? We're afraid of giving away those things that give us, if you will, the affirmation or the comfort or the fulfillment, even the highest elevations of, of good things that we should have, like families. We're afraid of losing things. That's the cross. We're afraid of loss. Um, even though we know by self-sacrificing love, our love will be purified. So picking up your cross, when we think of it spiritually, as it's come down to, to how we understand it, is not a rejection of something, but the idea of suffering in love for others or for something uh, without the sense of gain. And so we have some easy examples, right? We can understand this idea of letting go of possessions, right? We can understand the idea that we should not be attached to money or pleasure or power or honor or all these other base impulses over God. We know that, right? But can we see this regarding our relationships? Can we see uh, our relationships being in a way that aren't self-sacrificial to the other person if it brings us no, no uh, affirmation, if you will. Do some of our relationships have a controlling dimension to them, right? Because that makes us feel better when it's not loving of the other person. Do I have missed, this is a biggie one, and I say, I talk about this one a lot, right? The misplaced compassion, right? The fear of offending somebody. If we were meant to, the first simplest example of loving Christ above all things is to speak his truth in love to others, even if it's unpopular, even if you're afraid to offend, because you're giving them a gift. And the whole range of sexual, sexual moral missions, issues that we've been dealing with for however many decades, right? What can you, you can now today, you can be called a hater just for trying to point out what is unhealthy for people. And uh, that's one of the prices we pay. Today, also, with the Lord's words, it's very important also once in a while to bring up a very particular example of how one renounces possessions and even family. What? Out of love for him. And it's the idea of religious vocations. The idea of religious vocations. These need to be fostered. We, um, we're afraid of it, a lot of people are. I think, you know, in the old days, my dad told me when he went to Catholic high school, like we're talking like, you know, must have been in the 40s or 50s, right? Um, it was born in 39, so it was 1950s. But in a Catholic high school, and there was a boys' school, they would all be expected by the brothers that were teaching, and the priests that were teaching, to consider a religious vocation, either to the, the brotherhood or to, or to the priesthood, knowing that they might have to give up family life for that. So there is that direct correlation of loving God above all things, and some people are called to do that. But in our culture, the way it is, you know, a lot of times, People will, will speak of, um, well, people sometimes say, I think priests should be married, right? If, I, if you start digging down into it, right? If you start digging, you know, it's usually well-intentioned. I wish you priests didn't have to make so much sacrifices as if family life isn't a huge sacrifice, right? But, uh, the, uh, but if you dig down into it, it's almost like, what is it in you that is concerned about my family life, to put it, to put it mildly? Why does that person worry about my celibacy? And it's something that I learned in the seminary through spiritual direction because I was always kind of wringing my hands over this. I don't know if I should be married or be a priest. And my spiritual director one time said, well, that's because you can't see yourself as living a fully human life if you don't have the intimate uh, expression of the woman. We, we use more technical terminology than that, right? But without romance, you feel you can't have a fully human life. And I had to say, you're right, that's exactly how I feel. And it was like a light switch that went on. But yes, for love of God, if a, 
a woman or a man is called to serve in that way, he's asking us. If you know, if you if you discern this, and other people help you discern this, kind of when the Lord says, you know, um, you know, take account of these things. If you feel the Lord is calling you, then the answer is yes. I actually uh, always say, when I went to the seminary, I didn't go to the seminary to find out if I wanted to be a priest. Because first, you know, at, when I first walked into the seminary, if they said, we don't want you to be a priest, they'd be like, great, I get to go now and, you know, find a wife. I went to the seminary not to find out if I wanted to be a priest. I went to find out if God wanted me to be a priest. And if, if it's through spiritual direction, through other aspects of discernment in the seminary, if the answer is yes, then the answer is yes to God. At least that's, that's how I look at it. This applies to all vocations. Discernment of marriage, discernment of family, how to go through the different stages of life. All of it is sacrificing love. And all of it is about having the love of God purify our relations with one another. So today, in the gospel, as I was saying, we have another hard saying of the Lord, almost counter to some of his teachings, that word hate. And he is using that word, brutal sense, hate. Although in the Bible, sometimes there are different contexts of it. But one could ask the question based on what he's saying. I don't understand what he's saying. If I'm supposed to love my enemy, how am I supposed to hate my family, even my very self? What is he getting at? Well, one sense of thinking of it is he's definitely turning around to people who are following him, seeking something from him. He's very prominent. He's very, you know, maybe he's done some miracles. He's very popular. And he turns to them and says, you know, you have to hate everything. You know, you have, to, you have to renounce everything if you really want to follow me. You can't do this because there's some benefit to you. And it's hard to sift through that. But that sense of the word hate does have that brutal sense of when he says, you know, if, you're, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. There is that sense of saying, this, what he's trying to express here is not that I should have ill will towards any of my family members. But the gravity of what he's discussing is actually there. The... Um, the Catechism puts it this way, and this is the easiest way to understand it. Our bond with the Lord takes precedence over all other bonds, whether familial or social. That's just something to contemplate uh, when we think of where we are in our life, how we think of our relationships, you know, you know our tribalism, you know, how we, uh, how we honor our family, our parents, which we're supposed to do. But, but do we... Uh, put things above God, or we kind of put God in a certain place. The Lord is basically saying, when he says those words, you can love nothing above me, he's actually, in a way, pointing to who he is. When he says, uh, love me above all things with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole uh, might. He's basically pointing to the fact that he is God. And then, as, as we know everywhere in the Bible, we are supposed to prefer God, love God above all things. And so there can be a, a, a difficulty with that. In his examples, you know, when he says count the cost, get ready for the cost. Yes, it, it does mean we have to be ready to renounce the goods of this world that are gifts, our possessions. Be detached, even give alms to others to help others. This, this example of going to war, expect struggle, expect sacrifices in life. In the Book of Wisdom, we're asked, can we distinguish the difference between the passing things of this world, even our relationships? Can we see the time and effort we put into things in this world, which may be a misplaced priority over God, even relations, even possessions? And do we realize that the eternal truth and eternal love is available to us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit? And it's completely a gift. We can't attain that on our own. So to be able to have the eternal perspective, the eternal wisdom, allows us to understand why we love God above all things. And that is the upshot of what I was saying earlier. You cannot love them until you love them as I love them. The upshot is loving God, or as God, love means we love better. The more we love as God does, the more we put priority on God, the more we love those around us better. Both now and this life, and even if we're fortunate for all of us to love as God loves, to love one another eternally, not losing anything, but gaining it all in our return.
trust in the Father's mercy. We offer our petitions to the church and to this world at now. For our, for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, Cardinal Sean, Bishop Hennessy, and all those in authority, may the Holy Spirit give them the wisdom to prudently undertake the work of the Lord. And for all of us gathered here today, may we help each other to bear the crosses of our daily lives so that we might win redemption for ourselves and those we love. We pray to the Lord. For the leaders of our nation, may they enact laws that uphold the dignity of human labor and ease the burdens of the poor and infirmed. And for all those who earn their living with the sweat of their brow, may they find refreshment during this Labor Day weekend and feel proud of what their ministry accomplishments for their families and their communities. We pray to the Lord. Lord for all families in our parish, may the Lord ease their burdens, eliminate strife, and make them a light of faith, hope, and charity in our community. And for God's blessing on the academic year, may the efforts of teachers and administrators foster the just human and moral development in their students. We pray to the Lord. Lord for an increase in vocations to the priesthood and religious life, and in particular for those studying for the priesthood. May God assist them in their studies and help them, help them faithfully discern their vocations. We pray to the Lord. Lord. We pray for the sick and the suffering, especially those who have received difficult news about their health. May God console them in their difficulties and send them help from our family, neighbors, and friends. As always, we pray for those in our prayer corner, book of intentions, hospice care, assisted living, and all others in constant need of care. May the Lord remain close to them and preserve them from their discouragement. We pray to the Lord. Amen. We pray for those who have died, such as Denise Scarconi, whose family, whose funeral we recently celebrated, especially for Paul Ver and Joseph, excuse me, and Jamie and Jacob McDaniel, for whom this Mass is offered. May they, may they be welcomed into the eternal world, reward, and may those who mourn their loss be consoled. We pray to the Lord. Lord Heavenly Father, you never cease to watch over us. Grant all the petitions in accordance with your holy will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. See, just one announcement. The Novena to Our Lady of Guadalupe it is the fall. for nine Tuesdays, we will meet, uh, I guess, in here at 7 p.m. on those Tuesdays. And thank you for making this time, talent, and treasure to provide the parish and those who rely upon it. Blessed Lord God, all creation, for your goodness we have received, for mine we offer 
give us the gift of true prayer and of peace. Graciously grant that, through this offering, we may do fitting homage to your divine majesty, and by partaking of the sacred mystery, we may be faithfully united in mind and heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you so loved the world that in your mercy you sent us the Redeemer, to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours, that by sinning we have lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we do give you thanks as an exaltation we acclaim.
so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Monica, Saint Lucy, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O oh Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant, Francis R. Pope, Sean R. Bishop, Robert R. Zoe, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O oh merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you in their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, to whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
Make our priests fully and effective ministers of the gospel. Make our staff and worshipers dedicated and enthusiastic disciples. May we all be docile to the Holy Spirit, obedient to your will. Help us make our parishes a light for those seeking you and a safe harbor for those who hope in you. May we trust ourselves with the Blessed Virgin Mary as we pray. Hail Mary. Glorifying the Lord by your life.